Okay, so let's get going. Um, welcome everybody to uh, this last uh, day of the ASA meeting. Um, well done for getting this far on a, in a mostly Zoom session, um, at least for, for many of us uh, stuck in Sydney. Um, we've got a, a great um, set of talks today, as well as in particular some poster winner presentations um, at the end of this session. But just a few quick reminders before we start. Uh, first off is please post questions in the Slack channel. Um, and don't forget that there is a, a prize for the first student question. Um, but even if you're the second student question, that's uh, still a good thing. Please keep posting your questions. Um, the speakers, you have uh, 20 minutes plus five for questions. And I'll give you a, a verbal warning with five minutes to go, so at 15 minutes, and I'll give you another warning when your 20 gets up. Okay, so I'm gonna start off uh, now uh, by introducing Esteban Sander, who um, one of the key members of the SAMI Galaxy Survey, and he's gonna tell us about a decade of science with SAMI. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, so today I'm talking to you from Coogee in New South Wales, which is on the traditional land from the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So before I begin, I really want to pay my respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So when the organizers asked me to give the Sami overview talk highlighting the most recent science, I was in a bit of a pickle because with the amount of papers that we've now published, I could do two things. First, I could go through as many papers as I can within 20 minutes, probably speeding over all of the exciting results, but the takeaway would probably be 0%. So the other option I had was to highlight a few science paper, go into a lot of detail, but then I realized it's Friday morning. We're probably all zoomed out to our wits. So I want to take a third option. And so in this talk, what I want to do instead is highlight what the decade of science has looked like, um, primarily by asking the question, what made SAMI stand out? So SAMI is now one of many IFS surveys, um, but it was proposed about a little bit a decade ago. But of course, um, when you design a survey like this, you think about the future, you think about where the survey might be, you know, in five years time, in 10 years time. And I think when the SAMI team designed the survey, they had this in mind and really thought about the four key pillars that made this survey unique. And those four pillars are selecting a sample, not just from one uh, morphological type, meaning not just early type galaxies, so the lenticulars and their zeros, but really going for the full Hubble sequence um, of galaxies. The second is the spectral resolution. So spectral resolution is key if you want to get really accurate line profiles. And whilst for the stellar kinematics, um, that was maybe a second priority, in particular for the emission lines, high spectral resolution means that you can decompose the lines into many different components, um, leading to a lot of great science. The other huge step the survey took was to go from samples of around 300 to 600 galaxies all the way to 3,000 galaxies. So this is really that major step that Sami took um, that was not available before. And lastly, I'll argue that it was the wide range of environments. So not just picking field galaxies and galaxies in medium to high mass groups, but really going to the extremes of environment. So the most massive clusters in the universe that made this survey stand out. And so in the second part of the talk, I also wanna talk a little bit about what made Sami an outstanding success because 10 years from the first results that were presented, I think we have reached a point where we can say that a lot of the science questions that we had 10 years ago have been answered, um, but of course there's a lot more work to do. But let me begin with a little story from a long, long time ago, um, in a time where presentations will still, were still chiseled out on marble or written on papyrus. Um, this was a talk from Matthew Collers from 10 years ago, presented at the ASA, ASM, on the 4th of July in 2011. And Matthew presented a forward look for the Australian Astronomical Observatory, but also demonstrated uh, for the first time 
um, presented the highlights of the SAMI commissioning run, which had obtained the first results from that run the night before. And so Matthew presented these amazing results um, where the team had managed with just the first few nights of observations to get rotation curves from H alpha gas um, in 13 of 12 galaxies. So this really was a milestone because it meant that all of a sudden Australia was once again at the forefront of doing galaxy surveys, revolutionizing the way in which we measure um, resolved stellar properties of galaxies going from single object IFUs to multi-object IFUs. So this at the beginning really was the hard work of a core group of people. And so the semi prototype as shown here on the bottom left, which is this little white box, box with probably more duct tape in it that the team is willing to admit, was really built by the student Sam Richards under supervision of John Lawrence, Jocelyn Hawthorne, Julia Bryant and Scott Kroom. And it was really Sam who was amazing at building his instrument in an enormously short amount of time and getting it onto this old spectrographic, sorry, this old photographic unit that was lying around the AAT at the time um, and managed to get the instrument working uh, within a few nights on site. So while Sam was stuck in the top of the telescope for a few nights, dressed up here in his ski gear because it was freezingly cold in midwinter, um, the rest of the team was comfy in the observing room um, trying to produce the first results. But of course, all of this was a major team effort and I cannot stress enough how fantastic it was to get these first results. So for those of you who are familiar with observing at the AAT, here is a typical screen that you see where every line that you see here on that screen comes from 2D FDR, um, comes from the AA Omega spectrograph. And what they demonstrated here for the first time showing one of these hexa bundles where every line is a spectrum is these little wiggles of H alpha emission. And so this demonstrated already looking at these raw data that for the first time they detected H alpha emission from this multi-object IFS instrument. So this was all done with the SAMI um, prototype. And then the next SAMI instrument was really built to complete the full survey. So SAMI stands for the Sydney AAO Multi-Object Integral Field Spectrograph. So it is an acronym within an acronym. Um, which is probably a new milestone as well for astronomy. But what made SAMI unique, as I said before, was the fact that it was a multi-object integral field spectrograph. And so this was enabled by a new type of hexa bundle, um, a fused bundle of fibers demonstrated here at the bottom, or I guess calling it a hexa bundle might have been a little bit premature given that it looks fairly circular um, there. But the key is that by removing the cladding on all of these individual fibers, Julia and Joss were able to build a fused bundle with an extremely high fill factor, meaning that the space between all of these bundles was really, really small. So we didn't do a survey. You only need a few data pointings to get a full complete picture of a galaxy. And so then if you can build one of these, you can build 13 of these. So SAMI was, uh, was built out of 13 hexa bundles where one was always pointed at the star and 12 others were pointed um, on the galaxies. Every fiber, individual fiber was 1.6 arc seconds matching typical seeing on site. Um, and the total hexa bundle was about 15 arc seconds in diameter. These were all fed into the ground-based A omega spectrograph. And because it's a benched based spectrograph, it gives you an extremely stable spectral resolution. And this will be key for determining accurate stellar kinematics, but also doing the decomposition of the strong emission lines. So in the blue, we have a fairly average resolution of about 1800, which gives you an instrumental resolution of about 70 kilometers a second. But really in the red is where um, the magic happens where we go down to 30 kilometers a second. So the survey itself was um, selected targets were selected from the gamma fields, so three gamma fields, but also eight clusters. Um, it was a mass and volume limited selection, meaning that if you look at a function of mass and redshift in this figure here, then you see this red line here, which is a step function, which means that within all of these individual reg regions, we can do a volume correction, but we can also aim to get the highest completeness possible. 
So where gamma is extremely complete, but then selecting from gamma, we can also aim for a high completeness, which ended up around 80 to 90% in a lot of these regions. For each spectrum that we get, for each spectrum in the galaxy we get, we get about 10 emission lines and about 20 absorption features from which we can derive accurate stellar populations, stellar kinematics, gas emission line properties, and gas kinematics. And typically for each galaxy, we get around 100 spatially independent spectra because we imply a data pattern that we can oversample the 61 fibers um, ever so slightly. But as I said before, um, SAMI was not the first IFS survey, and it's definitely not going to be the last. So in particular, the surveys that happened before were, I guess, the, the most famous here one is probably the Atlas 3D survey, which had 260 galaxies based mostly on early type galaxies, so S0s and ellipticals. On the other hand, at the same time, you had these multi-object single fiber uh, surveys, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, 2DF, uh, two degree survey, um, and these had hundreds of thousands of spectra. So there really was this missing gap where on the one hand, you had a small sample of really resolved galaxies. On the other hand, you had huge statistical samples with just one single fiber measurement per galaxy. So this is really the regime where SAMI started to um, fill the gaps, where it really made a huge leap by a factor of five to about 10 as compared to previous surveys and really aimed for 3,000 galaxies. But it, as you can see, there's also this other survey now called Manga, which followed the lead of SAMI in the early days. Um, so you might wonder now, what made SAMI stand out? How were we different as compared to the other surveys when we knew that larger surveys or more detailed surveys um, were also upcoming? As I said, we have a huge sample size of about 3,000 galaxies, but when you compare this to Manga, um, it's still a factor of about three lower. We had a large range in morphology of early type and late types, which set them apart from the early surveys. But again, if you look at surveys like Manga, they employed the same technique. Where I think we really start to make a difference, as I said before, is in environment. So we're not just targeting the fields and large groups, which you can find in any gamma region, but we also targeted eight specific clusters that really trace the most dense environments within the universe. And this is so extremely important because we know that galaxies do transform when going from field to extreme environments. So having the full range of environments available to us uh, was paramount in answering our key science goals. And lastly, what I said is that the spectral resolution is a key defining feature of SAMI, in particular in the red, which sets it apart from other surveys. So when you then look at the key science goals that the SAMI Galaxy Survey had, um, it's no surprise that these key features of the survey also jump out immediately. So the first and not most, most important, I'd say, what, was what is the physical role of environment in galaxy evolution? Whilst we know that galaxies transform from spiral galaxies into lenticular galaxies when you go to more um, dense environments, a lot of questions about the physical processes that were um, responsible for this um, we're still missing. And in particular, when you look at gas, you need to have spatially resolved measurements because as compared to stars, which are nicely smooth distributed as a function of radius, gas is typically clumpy um, and you cannot predict where the highest region of emission always is. The other reason um, why you wanna do spatially resolved is that the dynamics of galaxies might also change as a function of environment. And whilst there were hints in previous surveys of this, um, the number statistics were missing uh, mostly. The second key science goal from um, SAMI was what is the interplay between gas flows and galaxy evolution? And here again, I think the uniqueness of having an integral field spectrograph is required because you need to know how the gas changes as a function of radius. So you need to do spatially resolved measurements. Lastly, how are mass and angular momentum build up in galaxies? This is where I think SAMI has a huge legacy value because really it became a benchmark survey for which to compare high redshift surveys to low redshift to compare large cosmological simulations um, to the SAMI sample. So this is really where um, the sample size was fundamental um, 
in making SAMI a success. So it's no surprise that you know, the biggest impact SAMI has had uh, was driven by its sample because all of a sudden we could take a 3,000 galaxies and study all of the different physical properties as a function of mass, environment, morphological properties, and star formation independently. So how did we do? How have we um, managed in trying to answer these fundamental questions that we posed at the beginning? So one way to, do, to show you this is by flashing all of the titles of all of the papers in front of your eyes. Um, but I don't think that's going to be very effective. So instead, I want to highlight how many papers we've published, um, probably as a function of time. Because as this demonstrated that early on, uh, when you had a few early papers, these were mostly papers to demonstrate um, how the survey works, the instrument works, setting out the science goals. But you really see an uptake in particular of papers that are trying to answer these fundamental questions as the sample grew in size. So around 2015, 2016, we had approximately 1,500 galaxies. So this is when we could really utilize the number statistics um, and go ahead and answer these questions. And you see that the number of papers keep increasing as a function of time. Um, and I don't think that 79 papers will be the end of SAMI. Um, I think there's many, many papers still to come out uh, over the next couple of years. Of course, when you look at this from a number of citations point of view, uh, we're doing rather well. We've got about 2,700 citations uh, to date, in particular, a few early papers that define the survey, um, the science goals doing well, as well as the, the builder papers that demonstrate how um, the instrument and data reduction um, was done. So to give you a little bit of a taster of what Sammy has been doing in recent years, I wanted to pick a few papers and demonstrate how these utilized these various pillars of the semi-survey um, and made it into a combined in a combination that really um, added something unique to the papers of other IFS surveys that were already out there. And so the first paper I want to highlight is a paper, this really wonderful paper by Shri O, who's at ANU, um, who really utilize the spatially resolved stellar kinematic management to do something that nobody had done before um, for such a large data set. So what Shri did is that if you look at a galaxy um, shown here on top, which is a galaxy that has both a disk and probably a bulge, what she used is a photometric decomposition of that flux in the bulge and the flux in the disk to fit two stellar kinematic components simultaneously. Yes, if I do that. Thank you, Scott. And when you do that, you see that for this galaxy, the bulge doesn't show much rotation, but has a high velocity dispersion, indicative of a lot of random motions within these galaxies, whereas the disk is rapidly rotating with low velocity dispersion. And the reason why this is so important is that when you look at something like the tully fisher relation, um, which, which shows the stellar mass of a galaxy as a function of its rotational velocity horizontally, then you find that this Tully Fisher primarily works for galaxies that are disk dominated. So in here, that's shown by the blue data points, which indicate galaxies which are both to total of less than 0.2, meaning they're disk dominated. For all other galaxies, you see that the scatter increases hugely. Now, when you employ this kinematic decomposition, you get two independent measurements for each galaxy, meaning one for the disk and one for the bulge. And when you use these measurements then, Again, you have here these blue points are just these disk measurements. And all of a sudden, you see that for all galaxies within this sample, um, the disk rotational velocity falls very nicely onto the Tully Fisher relation. But even for the bulge components, which have a lot less rotation, there's still a consistent scaling relation, uh, but just with a different intercept. And this is true both for the Tully Fisher and the Faber Jackson. So this is a really wonderful paper that um, shows that if you do this stellar decomposition, you at least the first order um, can explain the kinematic complex behavior of galaxies. Another really nice paper, uh, which was done by Henry Petro Jojo, um, was looking at the metallicity gradients of the strong emission lines, uh, using the strong emission lines. And so what Henry did is he measured all of these different uh, 
metallicity diagnostics and used those to measure the metallicity gradients. And what he, was, what he found is that there's actually a large discrepancy in these metallicity gradients when you use these different diagnostics. So he came up with this really wonderful conversion where if you have fewer strong emission lines, you can still calibrate these to match the ASCAL calibration. And when you do that, you all of a sudden find that these conversions, um, if you apply these, the metallicity gradients significantly improve um, as compared to each other. And these conversions now really provide the most accurate method of converting metallicity gradients when you don't have these key emission lines available. Another really amazing work which combines the environment and large sample statistics is from Charlotte Welker. And this is one of those papers that we hadn't expected to do or find a significant result just yet. This is something where we expected tens of thousands of galaxies to be needed. So what Charlotte did was to look at the transition of the spin orientation of galaxies as a function of how close they are to cosmic filaments. And so here, for example, you have a galaxy which is aligned with cosmic filaments, so these large um, overdensities in space connecting the large clusters. And um, here's a galaxy that is uh, misaligned. And so she used the stellar kinematic measurements to measure this alignment of the sp galaxy spin as compared to the orientation of the filament. And so when you look at this for a sample of low mass galaxies, which is shown here on the horizontal axis, where the measurement shows you how aligned low mass galaxies are to their filaments as compared to high mass galaxies, what you find is that this red dot, this black dot here with the red contour shows you results for SAMI meaning that low mass galaxies tend to align their spin with the nearest filament, whereas high mass galaxies are more likely to display an orthogonal uh, orientation. So due to lack of time, I'm going to skip this little paper here um, and just highlight that we've also managed now to release all of our data. So from 2015 onwards, we've released the early data release, data release one, data release two, and now data release three. So all of the data are really public. So I've hoped to demonstrate to you now what made Sammy stand out from the crowd. But what I haven't answered yet um, is what made Sammy a success. So in these last two or three minutes, I really want to sort of demonstrate what I think were the successes of Sammy and what caused these. So first would be the flexibility, the expertise, but also enthusiasm of all staff at the AEO and the AAT. Because where else in the world could you come to site with an instrument that looks like this, place it on an old spectrograph, an old photographic unit like that, um, an instrument that internally looks like this, on um, with equipment literally bought at Bunnings, in this case the flat lamp uh, to shine the dome, with duct tape observing instructions that says to open the shutter and turn off the lights on the inside of the instrument. Um, with a mirror that on bad days looks like this um, and bad nights that look like this. So I really think the AEO has been fundamental and been absolutely pivotal in making SAMI a success. The other thing, of course, were the centers of excellence, in particular Castro and Astro 3D, because they provided training for students, funding for postdoc positions to make this survey happen, travel support, Australian-wide engagement, and also being a driver behind a lot of the press releases. Of course, you can't do a large survey without a fantastic team. Um, and I think every team meeting I've been to has been wonderful, has been collaborative, um, has been productive. So the big team um, was definitely a key factor here. Observing with the team was fantastic. And I think by going to the telescope as a team, every time meeting different people, you build a stronger connection always. So I've always enjoyed all of my observing runs and I think the team is stronger because of it. Lastly, I think there's a really strong leadership um, and in particular Scott Croom and Julia Bryant have been leading by example. And by that, I don't mean that they take alcohol into the top end all the time. What I mean is that they were always at the forefront in doing the hard things. Scott in terms of the data reduction, Julia in terms of the instrument um, building. So where do we go beyond this? And in this last slide, I'll just quickly give you a teaser of what we're seeing now with SAMI uh, when you look at an environment as a function of stellar mass. 
Um, so this is really shows you the densest regions in the top, the lowest densest regions here on the left. But when you look at the dynamical properties of galaxies, we're now seeing that independent of mass, we're seeing environment playing a role, um, but also seeing mass playing a dominant role independent of environment. But with SAMI, we're limited to a stellar mass of 9.5. Whereas if you look at what we could have done, if we had perhaps a larger aperture or had better spectral resolution, um, two of the regimes where Hector will really take the lead, then we could have taken this whole regime and going to much lower mass um, and to much more dense environments. So I really have hoped to demonstrate to you what made SAMI an outstanding success. Not only was it because of the team and the leadership, but also because of the first choices the survey team took, meaning a sample with all morphological types, high spectral resolution, 3,000 galaxies across all environments. Thank you. Great, thank you, Yester. So we have time for one or two very quick questions. Um, the first question we had was from Johan Hansen. Um, why were 61 fibers chosen for the hexa bundle and similarly why 39 fuse? So the 61 hexa bundles and 13 IFUs comes down to a number roughly over 800. And that's the amount of fibers you can place on the A omega spectrograph um, before the, they're too tightly packed and you can't uh, resolve them anymore. So it really becomes an interplay between how many hexa bundles do you want and how big um, do you want to make them. And so it turned out that 61 hexa bundles was large enough to get approximately out to one to one and a half effective radii for all the galaxies in the survey. So that was a key driver for the size, whereas the total number of hexa bundles was set by the AO and spectrograph. Thank you. Okay, one final question. Maybe while uh, you're answering the next one, Adam can start setting up. So if you can stop sharing. Yes, sir. Um, so from Leonard Balkenhol, um, yes, a great talk. I imagine the SAMI survey collected a large data volume. Can you comment on the size of the data required and any challenges that came with handling it? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think the semi data was manageable um, because we did a lot of the reduction on site, meaning whilst the observing run was ongoing, we did a lot of the, the quality checks. Um, so it also meant that every time the that chunk of data could be produced and sent to um, our main machines in Sydney. Um, we have a wonderful uh, package to the FDR, which does a lot of the data reduction, but then another Python manager, which takes on the final reduction steps. So the data was not as large that we couldn't handle it. Um, things could still be sent over by just normal copying commands. Um, this is something that's definitely going to be more complex for Hector, um, but I think if you look at how long the full reduction took for SAMI on about 40 cores, then you're looking at probably a week uh, to a week and a half of a full uh, computational time. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Yessa. Um, great talk. And we should move on now. There are certainly plenty of other questions in, um, in Slack, so please go and have a look at those. But uh, now I'm gonna, we're going to move on to Adam Stevens, um, who is going to talk on Cosmological simulations, gas flows, and galaxy evolution. Away you go. Brilliant. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. I heard that uh, on the Slack channel, you guys were missing the camera zooming in on the back of my head. So I'm just going to give the presentation like this. I hope that's all good. Yeah, that's perfect. We, yeah, that's excellent. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, don't worry. I won't do that. Um, <laughs> Kia ora e te whanau arorangi. Uh, ko Adam Stevens tōku ingoa. Uh, I'm the Jim Buckey Fellow at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research at the University of Western Australia. Uh, let me first acknowledge uh, that I'm speaking from uh, Wanjak Nunga Buja. Uh, it's an incredible privilege to be on this land. Um, we should all take the time to acknowledge that on a daily basis. So the invitation that I had to give this talk felt a little bit open-ended to me. Um, something, something galaxies, something, something cosmological simulations, something gas flows, something. Uh, that was the parameters of what I was going to talk about. Uh, so this is going to be split into a couple of parts. I'm going to treat this like a little bit of an overview talk um, about cosmological simulations and gas flows. 
and then progressively get into some of the specific stuff that I'm actually interested in my research, which often relates to galaxy environment. So I know that many of you who are listening won't be galaxy evolution people, and you certainly won't be galaxy evolution theorists. Um, so let me just give kind of the, the, the overview of what galaxy evolution is. It all boils down to gas flows or gas cycles. Okay, so gas comes in cosmologically, it creates onto galaxies either in direct cold flows um, or, or through cooling. Once it's inside the galaxy, it'll form molecular clouds. Once you've got molecular clouds, you get stars. Once you've got stars, when they die or as they evolve, they produce energetic winds. This causes gas to go away from the galaxy. Some of that might come back down. Some of that might stay out in circumgalactic or intergalactic space. Uh, black holes are also a thing. They grow, and as they grow, the inertial mass, uh, or I should say the inertial energy of, of what is uh, accreted onto that black hole is released, drives jets, this creates more outflows, and as galaxies fall into uh, denser environments, they can be stripped uh, by, by the medium through which they're moving in processes such as ram pressure. So if you're not a galaxy evolution person, here's your take-home message already. It's that gas inflows drive galaxy growth and gas outflows regulate galaxy growth. And this is galaxy evolution in a nutshell. Okay, so that's it. You've got your take home message. Um, now, if you're actually interested in galaxy evolution, you can keep listening. Or if you want to learn something new, uh, you can also keep listening. So that sounds really simple in principle. The problem is that directly observing gas flows is really hard. Um, now, there are some ways that you can do this indirectly. Uh, for example, you can use things like quasar sight lines, uh, such that if you point your telescope towards a bright background source and that light happens to pass through circumgalactic gas, so that is gas around other galaxies, then you can learn about the metallicity and the relative motion of that gas. And that gas has to be either going towards or away from that galaxy, right? So it's telling you something about inflows or outflows. You might not be able to disentangle the two necessarily, but there's important information there and there's good work being done uh, by Glenn Kapzak, Nikki Nielsen, et cetera, uh, which I encourage you to look at in this field. Uh, deep H1 imaging can also help. You can get down to column densities of sort of 10 to the 18 inverse square centimeters. If you're not used to thinking about column densities and those sorts of units, 10 to the 18 might sound like a really big number. It's actually a really low number for these sorts of data. Um, but so the idea is that galaxies that normally appear very symmetric, uh, once you go deep enough, you should start to see signs that some gas is coming in on one side of the galaxy and not necessarily the other, because there's no reason why you would expect gas accretion to be a symmetric process. Uh, there's also some great work uh, in the um, environment space. So I'm showing here an image from, from a Dawes review by Luca Corteza, Barbara Catanella and company. Um, I'm going to treat uh, processes like ram pressure as a, as a gas flow, if you like. And you can see plenty of evidence for this um, from UV optical data uh, and, and, and other wavelengths as well, showing that gas gets lost from galaxies as they fall into denser environments. I guess the challenge with, with each of these images is that they are just that, they're images. And if you want to really see the full process of a galaxy obtaining gas and losing gas, the only way you're really going to do that in detail, sorry to tell you this observers, but it's with a cosmological simulation. So here, this video from the illustrious TNG simulation, you can literally see all of those processes I've just talked about happening right in front of you, okay? There is gas flowing into galaxies, there is gas coming out of galaxies from, from feedback and so forth. And all of these are, are trying to, do, all of these are doing is trying to solve the equations of gravity, of fluid dynamical interactions at their base level, then with um, a bunch of models that describe the processes that are astrophysically relevant that are happening uh, at the level below what you nominally resolve. And there are many of these simulations you would have heard of most of their names, I'm sure, unless you're completely outside the field, in which case, take note. Uh, they have, you know, varied, they're varied in their details, um, but they all boil down to the same basics. Most of them tend to be simulating universes that are of order tens of megaparsecs to hundreds of megaparsecs in each dimension. Remember, you've got to cube that, and I'm, that's, I'm talking about co-moving megaparsecs, to be clear. And they typically discretize the universe into mass elements that each have a mass of around a million times that of the sun. Okay, so it's like a, a universe where your quantum particle is a million solar masses. 
which is obviously not a perfect representation of reality, uh, but it does the job. And they all start from the same initial conditions. They're all trying to answer the question, what happens if you take the CMB, you tell a computer, sorry, the cosmic microwave background, I try not to spell acronyms out in actual words. Um, you tell it what gravity is, what, what electromagnetism is, and press go. Okay, um, so the thing is, even when you've done all that, you don't get information like accretion rates flowing out. From that, you have to have a PhD's worth of analysis. Okay, so I'm showing here some excellent work done by Ruby Wright. On the, on the left are just a couple of uh, images of gas around galaxies from the Eagle simulation. And in, those, in the boxes in each of uh, those two images, you can see percentages that are associated with different types of gas inflow. So you can have gas that might be flowing into a galaxy for the first time. It might have been processed in a different galaxy or by the same galaxy in the past. It might be coming in through a merger. It could be coming in through cold streams. It could be coming in from cooling around that, the galaxy of interest. And one of the things that we often say is that for, for galaxies to be able to sustain their star formation activity, they need to have a constant supply of gas flowing into it. Otherwise, that eventually stagnate and die out. And you can actually show that explicitly with a cosmological simulation as well. So on this plot, what you're seeing on the x-axis is relative accretion rate at fixed stellar mass, and on the y-axis, relative star formation rate at fixed stellar mass. And the idea here is that if you see a positive correlation, that's telling you that if you've got more inflow, you've got more star formation taking place, which makes sense. Although note that the slope of this line, and I've intentionally stretched this plot such that one decade is the same in both axes as you see it. Note that this is not a slope of one, it's much shallower and that there's a lot of scatter. So the idea that the galaxy evolution just boils down to inflow equals star formation rate is, is not quite it. There's a lot more to it. And this is why we there are so many people in this field and have been for the past couple of decades. Okay, so if there's one thing you're gonna take away from my talk and you're in this field and you have money, it's that you should hire Ruby immediately because the work that she's doing is, is, is highly impressive. I really encourage you to look at her papers. They're incredibly well written. Something I threw into this presentation relatively late in the game was off the back of uh, some of the conversations we were having on Slack on Tuesday. Uh, so G showed on, on Tuesday uh, how the angular momentum of, of gas around a galaxy is not necessarily the same as what it is of the dark matter halo. So some work that, that, that's relevant to that, which I just wanted to quickly highlight, is in 2017, where I, I took the Eagle simulation and, and measured what the angular momentum of gas that is cooling onto a galaxy has relative to that of a halo as a whole. And the reason why this is relevant is because it's not just the accretion of mass that matters for galaxies, it's the accretion of angular momentum that matters for galaxies. Angular momentum sets your size, size sets your density, density sets your star formation efficiency, and round and round the loop we go. Also of relevance here uh, is mergers, okay? They can bring in mass and angular momentum as well. And while the plot on the right here, the y-axis is showing a change in stellar angular momentum, um, it, you know, the, the, it, it matters for gas as well. So there, there was more uh, conversation going on in Slack about how, uh, and, and in talks by Ariana and, and other people earlier in the week, um, about how mergers can affect where the mass is in your galaxy. Well, typically it turns out from, from at least from Eagle, that dry mergers tend to drive down the angular momentum of a galaxy and wet mergers, that is mergers that bring in gas, tend to drive that up. Okay, so just by all of that knowledge that we have from simulations, when it comes from actually tr trying to do tests of how well they're performing relative to the real universe, because bear in mind, we want these to be representative of the real universe, we often have to boil this down to just integrated gas properties because that's where we have most of our data. So the simplest test you can do is just draw a probability distribution function of the galaxies as a function of their gas mass. So on the top here, you're seeing this for atomic gas, on the bottom for molecular gas. There are results from three different cosmological hydrodynamic simulations there, and some observational data to compare against, uh, that being alpha alpha and X cold gas. And you can see that in general, these simulations are, are, are recovering the basic statistics of gas properties of galaxies reasonably well at redshift zero. Uh, you might look at that line for Eagle and go, uh, I'm not sure that's quite right, but it's okay if you look at the higher resolution version of that simulation that's sorted it out. So the real tests then often come in scaling relations, because if you don't have the right amount of gas for a given 
uh, stellar mass, where you don't have the right amount of gas for a given star formation rate, where you don't have the right amount of gas for a given stellar mass density, which is a proxy for morphology, then something's probably gone wrong with the way that inflows and outflows are taking place and how they're balanced. Um, so these are, again, just examples in terms of both atomic gas fraction and molecular gas fraction for the same simulations uh, and, and data sets uh, that, that, that I've already shown in, in, in those previous plots. So the idea just to take away from this is this, these are the simple ways that we, that we test how these simulations are performing and they're doing, roughly speaking, what they're meant to do, some better than others, whatever. Uh, if you want to know details about that, read papers, I guess. Um, so, but even, even to make these relatively simple tests, you can't just, it, it's not like these, this information just falls out of the simulation onto your, onto your lap. At least it doesn't fall onto my lap. Um, often you have to do more processing. So for example, in, in some of these simulations and actually not in the case of the Simba simulation, but certainly in the case of Eagle and Illustrious, we have to post-process them to know how much gas is it, that's in a galaxy is in an atomic state and how much is in a molecular state. And there are many different methods for how you can do this decomposition, but they tend to all have the same three ingredients. That is, you first need to know what your ionized to neutral fraction is. You need to know where and how many metals you have and what the flux of um, molecule dissociating radiation is, or more specifically, UV photons at around 1,000 angstroms, i.e. that in the lyman werner band where you've got enough energy to dissociate molecular hydrogen, but not so much that you ionize atomic hydrogen. So the way that we do this is we first identify all the sites of star formation within a given simulation. We, we assume that that's where UV is being produced and we propagate that through the galaxies using like a cheap version of radiative transfer. It's not real radiative transfer, but it's close enough for the sake of what we're doing. Bear in mind that we're processing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of galaxies at a time per snapshot per simulation, which is why we make necessary approximations. Combine that with uh, the neutral gas information that you may or may not have uh, already. And then from that, you can start building up maps of where the molecular gas is relative to the atomic gas. But even then, you're still not done because that's not what you observe in a typical survey. What you then have to do is if you want to observe to a, sorry, if you want to compare to a given observational data set, you need to make sure that the way that you're treating the gas properties in your simulation is the same as the way that they would be observed in that survey. So what you're seeing here are five galaxies from the illustrious TNG simulation. The top row is imaging all of the molecular gas in those simulations. And on the bottom, what, I've, what I'm showing you is the gas that you would be sensitive to if you stuck down a, a, a Gaussian beam on top of that galaxy for a single dish observation using, uh, you know, based on the, the, the specifics of the X coal gas survey, that is using the IRAM 30 meter uh, radio telescope and knowing what the redshift distribution of that survey is, you can just translate your, your angular beam size into a physical beam size. Now, remember that a survey like that doesn't give you images of galaxies, it just gives you a, a total amount of content that's there. So what you really get is the integral of the maps you see on the bottom, but those are just designed to highlight um, that, you, that you might potentially miss out if you've got, say, extended spiral arms in molecular gas. Uh, you, you, you can miss out on these sorts of things if, if your beam isn't big enough. Of course, if your beam is too big, then you have different sorts of problems as well. Um, but I don't necessarily have time to get into all of that. Okay, so what kind of gas flows can we learn about once we've gone through all that trouble and we've started to just compare to, to integrated properties? Uh, well, this is where we start to get into the environment thing. So we've known for a long time um, that galaxies at a fixed stellar mass that are in denser environments or in higher halo masses, that means the same thing, they have less atomic gas on average. And that's exactly what this plot shows you. Adam, five minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, this, re this result is recovered in simulations. Um, this is the same data and showing you results from illustrious TNG on top of that. I've just changed the y-axis so it's now relative H1 richness instead of absolute gas fraction, but it's the same thing. Okay, so that, that result's reasonably well recovered. Uh, the different lines are just different methods for doing that gas phase decomposition I was talking about before. So that, that's good to know that, uh, that at least that physical process is, is seems to be happening in the right way. Of course, we can do more than just make those plots. We can then actually make videos of, of, the, of that process literally taking place within the simulations. What you're seeing here is a satellite galaxy falling into a halo in illustrious TNG. You'll see that some of the circumgalactic medium is stripped away before 
uh, some of the atomic and, and molecular gas that's deeper in the potential well is. Um, and what I'm also going to do here is, is freeze when this galaxy has a close flyby to its central and then rotate because then you start to see all the complex structure that you can have these jellyfish-like tails, which have now been you know, known to be observed for, for, for a number of years now. All these features uh, are in there and can be studied in further detail when you want to compare to those uh, more detailed resolved observations. Okay, so this plot shows what I've basically already said, that is that satellites are gas poor relative to centrals at a fixed stellar mass that's seen in both the observational data, that is the points and the lines, uh, the simulations. Something that hadn't been investigated in as much detail is the equivalent plot for molecular gas. So this is from some of the most recent work that I've done. You can see here that both the, the points and the lines are now a lot closer together on the plot on the right than they are on the left, which means to say that the effective environment on molecular gas is much weaker than it is on, on atomic gas. And to first order, this is just because molecular gas sits deeper in the potential well and it takes longer to be affected by what's happening. Now, if you ignored those lines, if you're an empiricist and you ignore those lines, you just look at the points, you might say, well, I'm not really sure that there's actually that much of an observational signature there given the significant size of those error bars. To really convince yourself statistically that there is a signal, you have to combine all of these data into one dimension and just do a cumulative distribution of the relative H1 richness. So now we're controlling for, for stellar mass and just measuring what the, what the H2 fraction is relative for that of a typical galaxy at its mass. And now you can see that it's actually pretty clear, right? There's about a 0.2 to 0.3 dex difference uh, observed in the, in the molecular gas content of centrals relative to satellites uh, for all stellar masses above 10 to the 9. And you'll see that there are lines for the simulation there that, that agree really well. Now, this is actually one of those situations where, I, where we thought, let's, let's make a prediction about this because that hasn't been done before. Go into the simulation, draw it up. What do we expect to observe? We expect to observe this. Okay, what data do we need? Well, those data are already in the literature. Let's download those data and let's make the plot and put them on the same axes. And voila, we had a prediction confirmed. So this is, and that doesn't happen normally. That you actually go through that process in that, in that organic kind of fashion. And because of that, we had a press release about this work because um, I couldn't quite believe how well this worked myself. If you want to know more about it, uh, I've got a pinned thread on Twitter that um, discusses it all. And now, so this is normally where I would, uh, end my talk, uh, but it's not going to be quite where I end my talk. But let me just say that really what I've only touched on is, is the tip of the iceberg here because this field is so rich and there's so much stuff I haven't talked about and probably the questions you're going to ask me have some weird overlap between the stuff I've talked about, the stuff I haven't talked about and the stuff you're actually interested in and maybe some are going to be quite out of thin air, I don't know. Okay, but before I finish, um, I want to make an important point right after Natasha has taken her Twitter photo. <laughs> okay, all of these simulations and the data that we need require an immense amount of, of energy to take, right? And, and as we discussed on, on Tuesday during the sustainability session, supercomputing is currently our biggest source of carbon emissions. Now, this is from uh, a study that I led a couple, of, a couple of years ago that was published last year, and the situation is not so bad uh, today because uh, there's been investments towards renewable energy that are powering supercomputers in the ACT in Victoria. And COVID has of course taken care of uh, the, the problem that was flight emissions for us. And let me just make this point, right? COVID has taken away a problem for us. So we're now in a position where we can choose to keep that problem away or bring it back. Um, and this is, this is part of the reason why I'm actually really proud to have had some involvement in organizing this hub, because I think this kind of model is, it's not just the way of the future, it's the way of the present, okay? We've been forced into this situation, let's make this work when we've been we given the opportunity. So really, if there's only one point that you're gonna take away from this talk, it's this. <laughs> Cease burning fossil fuels entirely. And I mean this entirely. And you might say, well, Adam, that's a great message that you should be sending to fossil fuel corporations and to governments. But there's actually a reason why I'm sending it to you guys as well, because all of us have stakes in this, in, in the climate crisis. All of us are currently, or many of us, probably most if not all, are contributing to the problem. Until we get rid of all of those bars on the plot in the background, we're contributing to the problem. And we need to choose to be part of the solution instead. 
And the solution to this is relatively easy, right? We just need to make sure that the work that we're doing is being powered by renewable energy. And until we do that, I'm not convinced that the work that we're doing is ethical. And if the work that we're doing is unethical, we shouldn't be doing it. So on my last slide, I just want you to sit with that. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. For, um, there are many questions on Slack. Um, first one from Clancy James, and I'll paraphrase because it's a rather long question. Um, imagine we could fully measure the ionized gas column density using FRBs for some part of the cosmic web. Which part of that cosmic web, for example, superclusters or filaments or groups, would be most interesting and informative? to compare to simulations? Uh, I mean, all of it. Chuck, it chuck, chuck all of your data my way. I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't know that I've got a, a, a singular answer for that. All of it, all of it, always. <laughs> Sorry if that's a very generic answer. That's OK. So um, from Amelia Fraser McKelvey, we have a question. You simulators seem to have it all figured out. What do you still need from us observers to prove your theories? Uh, no offense, Amelia, I'm not really sure that that's the most well-posed well question, which makes it difficult for me to, for, to, to, to answer it. Look, there's, there, there's no one simple answer to, to any of these sorts of questions, and it's not really a case of um, I've come up with these wacky ideas and I need, and I need some data to do it. This is, look, this, this is an, an iterative collaborative field. It's, it's not a case of observers do this, simulators do this. This, this is... <laughs> The role that I actually have is designed to be at the interface between observations and simulations, even though I'm predominantly a theory person. And I'd actually like to break this mold of there being this, this separation and this, yeah, the, the, this idea that, that surveys and, and simulations don't work in tandem, because they do work in tandem, and, and the way that we learn is, is very iterative. So, if there's something, there's so much to explore as well. So you, look, it, it, this is such a difficult question to answer because I've got to come up with things that can be tested, but at the same time, there's already so much information in the literature um, from, from observational data that needs a theoretical explanation. So I, I don't even know where you start with this. I don't think that there's just a simple answer to, to proving that Lambda CDM works, that we've got um, star formation sorted, that we've got AGN sorted. Uh, it's, it's a slow iterative process. And again, I'm sorry that that's not a direct answer. Um, that's quite all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe time for one more question. Um, Matthew Collis, how well do the simulations reproduce the evolution of the total density of H1 and H2 gas associated with galaxies over time? Okay, that's a good point. I can direct you to um, a paper by Benedict Diemer, on which I'm second author from 2019, that looks at this. I think this might also be looked in some of Ramil Dave's book as well. Uh, the answer is uh, it's not too bad for H1, and I don't actually think we really know. Oh, wait, wait, which way around is it? Now I'm confusing myself because we've been put on the spot. For one phase of gas, it looks fine, and for the other one, it's kind of like, we don't know, because I think the error bars on some of the data are quite large. Um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I, I don't know that it's perfected per se, but I think that within uncertainty, it's qualitatively fine. <laughs> Again, not a very clear answer, I'm sorry. But there are others, there, yeah, check out the papers that I just mentioned. Okay, all right, look, we should leave it there. There are many other questions for Adam on Slack, so please continue the conversation there. Um, thank you again, Adam. Uh, and now we'll move on to Tessa Wernstrom, who is gonna to talk to us about unveiling the magnetized cosmic web. Yep. All right, great. Uh, can everyone hear me online? Yeah. Yep. All good. Okay, uh, so I just want to take a second to uh, first thank the SOC and all the many LOCs for putting together this uh, great meeting. It's been really nice uh, seeing all the science and seeing everyone in person. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about some recent work uh, unveiling the magnetized cosmic web. But I'm going to start, uh, I guess, at the beginning or the basics and say, what is the cosmic web for anyone that doesn't know? So my two-second spiel of cosmology is 
We have fluctuations in the early universe in the primordial matter density. And these small overdensity areas, you've got matter coming together, forming stars, stars and galaxies. Galaxies come together to make clusters of galaxies that are connected by filaments. So all this makes this lovely web-like pattern. So what about the magnetized or synchrotron cosmic web? Well, we've got magnetic fields that are kind of permeating all these large scales. And we've got intergalactic shocks from infall of matter into and along the filaments and, and the clusters. So this is going to accelerate electrons, amplifying magnetic fields and producing synchrotron emission, which we can detect in the radio. So basically the large scale structure of the universe, the, the cosmic web should glow in the radio. And we think that that should be uh, strongest on scales of say, arc minutes to, de to degrees and uh, at low radio frequencies. So that's basically the what, but how about the why? Why should we care? Well, magnetism is a fundamental force of nature, but we really have almost no idea about its significance in the role of getting us to where we are today. Um, we really don't know how important it is in galaxy formation and evolution and what role it's playing. So there's still a lot of important questions that need to be answered, such as, you know, what is this role in structure formation and evolution? Um, what is the origin of cosmic magnetic fields? How did they get there? And how have they changed over time? There's a lot more questions as well, such as, you know, dealing with um, potentially even uh, cosmolo big cosmological questions like the Hubble tension. So we can look at um, magnetohydrodynamic cosmological simulations um, for predictions and information here. So when it comes to the origin scenario of cosmic magnetic fields, you get a few different ideas. There's the one about a primordial seed field, so basically a, a uh, very homogeneous uh, early universe seed field. And then you can also get um, turbulent dynamos and then injection from astrophysical sources such as star formation and AGN processes. Now, depending on which of these there is, um, what they predict for what we would see now looks quite different. So in these couple of different examples here, you can see that with a, a strong primordial seed field, the uh, filamentary structure is, is much more, um, it's giving off much more emission. So basically, if we wanna try and answer, you know, is there a seed field, how strong is it? Uh, we really need to be looking in between the clusters so that the cluster areas look basically the, kind of the same. So we need to look for filaments. Um, if we want to answer this. So the simulations can tell us that about one to 2% of the magnetized warm hot intergalactic medium and filaments would be detectable by current or next generation radio telescopes. It goes up a little bit for say like cluster outskirts. Uh, but the predictions for the magnetic field strengths is about nano to micro gauss range, uh, but it's very model dependent. So it depends on what value you put in for your magnetic, your primordial field strength um, and other you know, things that you can tune in your simulations. And a lot of these simulations tend to neglect things like um, you know, imaging artifacts, uh, system errors, as well as say, like galactic emission and point sources. That's the simulations. How can we actually detect it then? Well, the most obvious answer is just go out and take an image of it. What's the problem? Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute. So we have detected some diffuse emission in clusters. Uh, here's some nice examples with the radio emission in red and the X-ray emission in blue. Um, and we break the radio emission into kind of uh, different morphological classifications like halos, mini halos, and relics. There's only really a few hundred of the, uh, these uh, detections that have been made, and it's usually in more high mass cluster systems or, or dynamically active. Um, so here's just a few more pretty pictures of some of these uh, relics and halos. And in terms of the magnetic field strengths in uh, the more dense cool core cool clusters, you're looking at maybe 10 to 30 microgauss. Um, but for lower density, you're in the um, micro gauss range and then for these um, very diffuse cluster halos you're getting into the sub micro gauss range now it was only um you know i used to be able to say we've never detected any emission in between the clusters at larger scales but that changed a couple of years ago here now we had the first detection of an intercluster bridge with giovanni et al in 2019 so it's really exciting um, and then followed up one year later with the second detection from botian et al in 2020 so both of these were made with the LOFAR telescope, which is a low frequency radio array in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so you can see that um, we've got two clusters separated by maybe one to three megaparsecs with some diffuse emission in between. So uh, we say kind of bridge or ridge rather than filament because the filaments can be much longer. So many megaparsecs long. These are a bit shorter, which means you can sometimes have to worry about then the um, overlap from the cluster emission itself. So why is this so difficult? Um, well, we expect this emission to be low surface brightness. So it's faint and spread over large areas. And like I said, strongest at low frequencies and you require uh, high sensitivity to large, large angular scales. 
this is something that until more recent generations of radio telescopes, we did not have. Uh, but then you also have things like the bright galactic foregrounds, um, bright AGN, star forming galaxies, a lot more faint sources that are causing confusion, and then instrumental noise. So all of that can be fainter than this, or brighter than the signal you're looking for. So just to demonstrate that a little more, here's just a simulated uh, filament between two clusters. And it's convolved with a one and a half arc minute beam. And if we add point sources that are also convolved with the beam, by the time we get to around the Milijansky range, you've basically kind of lost your diffuse emission. And for anyone who isn't very familiar with Jansky's, uh, Milijansky for radio sources is not even that bright. So this is when we need to get creative. Um, so you've got a bunch of other uh, kind of statistical techniques or other ways to get at that. Um, and this is where I come in. Today I'm going to talk about my most recent project, which was using stacking. So stacking, for anyone that again isn't familiar, is a technique that you can use to increase your signal above the noise. Um, so you use prior information about where to look, so from other, say, catalogs or something, and you can take little cutouts of the object you're interested in, you add them together and take the average, and this should hopefully decrease your noise enough that you're able to look at the average signal. Um, so you need a large number of objects to stack, kind of depending upon how noisy you expect your signal to be in relation to um, the signal itself. And in the case of filaments that we're talking about, we need to know where they are and we need to be able to align them. So in this you know, little example here, you can see there's, it's a simulation, so we know where the clusters are. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier, but in, in reality, it's, it's not always the case. Um, so we need to know where to look. Uh, the easiest answer is in between clusters that are, are right near each other, so say at the same redshift. But there's not very many clusters known. So I get some funny looks when I say that, because um, <laughs> it's kind of relative terms. Yes, we know thousands of clusters, um, but we need an order of magnitude or two more than thousands. Um, so we can use a tracer for clusters, um, and in the in luminous red galaxies, or LRGs. So here's my very uh, realistic example here. You've got two clusters with a luminous red galaxy in the center connected by a filament. Um, now with the SDSS catalog, we've got over a million of these objects known, and they are known to reside toward the center of groups and clusters. And then we get photometric redshift information, at least from SDSS. So we can look for pairs of LRGs that are close together physically. Uh, so we find a sample of about 390,000 of LRGs. Now they have a range of, um, angular separations from about 30 arc minutes to um, around three degrees, with an average around 90 arc minutes, and then a range of physical separations from one megaparsec to about 15 megaparsecs with an average of about nine, and they range uh, redshifts with an average about 0.14. This kind of just shows the, well, it shows where they are in the sky, but it's basically just the coverage area of SDSS. Um, but then we need to know what to stack on. Um, now, as you can see, this covers a very large area of the sky, which can be a bit limiting then when you're looking for radio data to stack on. So we uh, chose to use the Murchison Wide Field Array, or MWA GLEAM survey, which, uh, yay, GLEAM, which is uh, all sky survey um, south of declination plus 30, so basically all southern sky. There's multiple frequency bounds, so we use frequencies at 154, 118, and 88 megahertz. Resolution of several arc minutes and um, noise values of um, 30 to you know, 150 or more Milijanskis per beam. And then also we use data from the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array over at LWA. Bit of a mouthful, I know. That's the All Sky Northern uh, Survey, so north of declination minus 40. Um, this had multiple frequency bands as well, but we just chose the highest frequency for them, which was 73 megahertz. So that's a bit lower resolution, bit higher noise. And then because um, the radio or the x-ray data can also trace large scale structure and can be correlated with the radio, we chose to also stack on the ROSAT All Sky Survey or RAS um, and those corresponding maps. So that's, uh, this is just what those look like here. So we've got the three different Gleam maps, the Owens Valley maps, you can see the kind of different sky coverage there, and then the ROSAT map as well. So how do we actually do the stacking? So uh, again, like I said, with the filaments, it's a little bit tricky because you need to, um, they can have all different orientations on the sky. So we need to align them. Basically go to your LRGs, you make a cutout around them, and then you rotate it so that they all lie on the same axis. And then because there's a range of separations, range of sizes, we also need to kind of rescale it or regrid it to a normalized grid. 
So in this case, then you've got always got an LRG at you know zero and plus one and zero and minus one. So that way, any signal that's that's there can add coherently. So this is just an example of one of the cutouts with um, the MWA data, the Gleam data, and you can see in an individual snapshot. It's not very exciting. Doesn't really look like much. Even even at the LRG positions, you really don't see anything. But when you do a, you know, a few hundred thousand of them, you get something that looks like this. Um, so this just shows, yeah, the three, four different radio frequencies here. You do see some bright spots that correspond to the positions of the LRGs or clusters with some kind of diffuse emission coming off in between and around those as well. Um, but that's, so that is a detection of something, but that's not really what we're interested in. Um, worry, we wanna know about what's in between those bright points. So we need to, to kind of take away everything that's not uh, potential filament. Um, so to do that, we assume an isotopic background and make a model kind of just averaging radially around each one of the LRGs or clusters. You can see kind of a 1D profile there and you add those two models together. And we've got a model for both of those that we can then subtract off from the stacked image and look at the residual. So going back here, there's our uh, four radio stacks and then the four models. We subtract one from the other, uh, we get this. So the little box highlights the region in between those. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, what? I was shocked. When you work below the noise and statistical methods, you tend to not see anything but noise and make upper limits and constraints. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I've heard a few people this week talk about their favorite images of their career. So far, this is probably mine. But you don't wanna get ahead of yourself. You gotta make sure that what you're seeing is actually real and then figure out what it is. Um, so to do this, we started with a, kind of a null test or a control sample. So we uh, chose the same number of LRG pairs with the same kind of distribution in angular separation but ones that are separated physically, so thousands of megaparsecs apart. So you would not expect to see a connecting filament. We did you know, a few hundred thousand of those and then did that hundreds of times. And this is the results from the null tests. So that's um, you know, comforting that there's nothing there when you wouldn't expect there to be something. Um, and then this just shows the results from the uh, X-ray stacking as well. So again, you can see kind of a very similar look to it and this excess emission in between the two LRGs as well. So because we had the few, uh, few different radio frequencies, we can look at the spectrum. So again, if this was just some kind of random signal or noise, you would expect it to be pretty flat, um, which is what you see with this null test or control group down at the bottom, which is basically consistent with zero. Um, now when we fit a, a spectral index to um, the real sample or the physically related pairs, we get a spectral index of about minus one. So this is a bit steeper than you expect from the average radio galaxy synchrotron emission, which is around minus um, 0 0.7. So this is more consistent with um, what you would expect from accretion shocks, which is what we would think might be causing this diffuse emission. So again, that's good. Um, but you can see steeper, um, steeper spectral indices with uh, some AGN, particularly in the radio with their, their lobes and jets and things. Uh, so we investigate a little bit more the possibility of point sources. So we know that radio emission um, from point sources correlates with the infrared emission because of star formation processes. So the star formation in the radio correlates with the infrared emission. Uh, so the, the far infrared radio correlation, it's well known. There's um, the ratio says that depending on which frequencies and wavelengths you're talking about and the type of galaxy, whether it's star forming or AGN, you would expect the infrared to be anywhere from 10 to 150 times brighter. So we went and found um, the infrared maps that we could that were all sky and did the stacking on those uh, the same way, same sample. You can see it's almost the exact opposite. You can almost see the little bit of the, the clusters in one of those, but when you look at the residual along the bottom, there's just nothing. So we don't expect it to be dominated, um, the signal that we see to be dominated by sources. Um, we also did the stacking on the Planck um, s -Z maps. So again, you would not expect an s -Z signal to be coming from galaxies. Um, so we see here this SZ signal. Again, there's the, the stacked and then this is the residual. So you see this excess emission between the clusters again. So we did what we could to kind of assure ourselves that it's not just galaxies along the filament that might be causing this. And if we assume that it is a diffuse emission, we can talk about magnetic field strengths again. So there's a couple equations you can use. If you assume equal partition, you get this nice big equation here. You have to make some assumptions about what parameter, what to put in for these different parameters, but we get something on the order of 50 to 60 nanogauss. 
five minutes to go. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we can also use inverse Compton scattering if we assume that that's what's causing the X, all of the X-ray emission to get kind of a limit on what that would imply for the magnetic field strength from that, and that's about 40 nanogauss. Um, so there have been studies looking at the intergalactic magnetic field strength using Faraday rotation studies, and those found um, magnetic field strengths along the line of sight around 4 to 10 nanogauss, so almost an order of magnitude difference. Now, it doesn't mean that one of these is particularly wrong. What it could mean is that um, for rotation measures, or RMs, you're only going to really see that if it's a, more of a co coherent field. But if it's all tangled and turbulent, you're not going to see as much of a net rotation measure. So this could be telling us that filaments are more turbulent than we maybe previously thought. Uh, so we can also compare then with magnetohydrodynamic simulations. Uh, this is uh, just a cutout, a small area from the one that we compared with. So with the MHD simulation, we went and found halo pairs um, that kind of, you know, uh, approximated our distribution of separations, put them on the same grid as we did for the real data, and looked at the average emission in between the halo pairs, and you get this kind of green distribution over there. Now, when comparing with what we observed at one frequency, you find uh, it's about 40 times higher, the observation over the simulation. So again, this, the simulation had a set primordial magnetic field strength, so that could mean that that needs to be about 40 times higher. But also, if you um, change things like the ex electron acceleration efficiency, that would also, um, could also help increase those values. Um, so if we compare this with other um, detections of the bridges that I mentioned earlier, the, the Giovanni et al. had this paper here, which looks at the emissivity at one scale to 1.4 gigahertz of known radio halos and, and large scale candidates here. You can see that their um, bridge detection is right at the, the lower end of that. And if we were to put our stacking result on their plot, um, it's off the plot. <laughs> so we're a few orders of magnitude below. But this is the average of a distribution of filaments. So they might be detecting the bright end tail, whereas we're looking more at the average. So what is the um, you know, predicted observability of something like that? It's hard to say, but what we did was just took a, a kind of toy model for um, a filament between two clusters here. And we scaled the emission that was in between so that the average was the same as, as detected at one of our, our gleam frequencies. And when you do that and convolve it with an observing beam, it has a peak of around five microjanskis for 10 arc second beam, 50 microjanskis for a 50 arc second beam. Now, um, with current telescope like LOFAR, they're only getting down to about 180 microjanskis, so not close. Um, but SK low is predicted to be more in this range. So, what can we do um, from here? Well, we can still look for more targeted observations of uh, between, fil or between clusters to look for these filaments. So we can use detections in, say, X-ray or lensing maps, um, other, other frequencies, to um, tell us where to look maybe in the radio. Uh, there's other statistical tests, such as cross-correlations. So cross-correlation is another method that can enhance correlated signals above the noise. So you can use the radio data with other tracers of large-scale structures, such as the X-ray maps or get number, uh, galaxy number densities. And then again, to look at the line of sight magnetic field strength, you can use uh, rotation measure grids, which we heard a bit about yesterday, um, to get a lot of lines of sight through the clusters or filaments and, and um, so that we can then compare the plane of the sky magnetic field strength with the um, line of sight. So how are we gonna do all of that? Well, right now is a really exciting time. Um, we don't just have to wait for the SKA, there's a lot of, current surveys and new surveys coming online just in the next few years. Um, so we've got large area ones um, at kind of mid frequencies with EMU and Possum doing the polarized sky, deep surveys with Meerkats, Mighty, um, new low frequency from GleamX, um, northern sky mid frequencies with JVLA's BLAS. Uh, so it's really unprecedented coverage in frequency, sky area, sensitivity, everything. Uh, so there's gonna be a, you know, more data than we know what to do with. Um, so hopefully we can do something with it. Uh, but just to summarize, we did make the kind of first average detection of diffuse emission between widely separated clusters. Um, so that's kind of the distinction there is, you know, our average difference between the clusters was nine megaparsecs compared to one to two from the bridges that have been detected. Um, and we're able to infer some, um, you know, physics from that, um, make some predictions about the observability of that right now or in the future. And I just like to say that methods other than direct imaging though are important and necessary tools to be able to limit and detect and constrain. Um, so there's just some things that are always gonna be fainter than what we can actually detect. Um, so it can be difficult, you usually need models to interpret it and you have to deal with a whole bunch of other things like noise and galaxies that are bright, um, but it doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. 
and I will leave it there. Thank you, Tessa. So um, quite a few questions on Slack. Um, the first one is from Balu Shrida. The question is, um, you mentioned that magnetic fields are strong on scales of one degree. Why is that? Um, sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> um, you mentioned that magnetic fields are strong on scales of one degree. Why is that? Um, so it's just talking about um, why it would be stronger on larger degrees or larger scales of around degrees or something. Um, that's just looking at the, the scale. Um, so that's very redshift dependent when I say that. So it's, it's more about the kind of several megaparsecs in length. And in, at least in the local universe, that would correspond to larger um, angular degrees or angular scales. I mean, sorry. Okay, if we want to look at high redshift, then we're talking about smaller angular scales. But that's even harder to detect. <laughs> uh, so uh, a question from Nick Seymour. Um, is the X-ray emission thermal or inverse Compton or both? Um, it's most likely thermal. So we did, um, when we compared with um, a thermal cosmological simulation that went along with the, the magnetic field um, simulation, it almost exactly kind of matched what the MHD simulation was predicting just based off of thermal, thermal emission. But there could be some component of that that's from inverse Compton scattering. But, um, I would have to do something, so a little bit more work to kind of try to tease that out, which one is which. Right. Um, so a question from Roland Crocker. Uh, sorry if I missed it, but what do you assume about the electron shock acceleration efficiency for your baseline model? Um, I would have to look at what the numbers were. Again, it's in Franco Vazza's 2019 paper, but there is just kind of a set value, I think, that he uses for the simulations for the electron acceleration efficiency. Um, and the different Mach numbers. Um, so that, yeah, that is already set. We didn't like make new simulations for this, this exercise. Um, so that's something that, that can be tuned um, within the simulations if we wanted to go, you know, try and match it better with a new set of simulations. But I don't remember the number right offhand. Um, another question from Alec Thompson. Lots of questions. Everybody's been very active on Slack. It's great. Um, from Alec Thompson, the null test stacking images seem to show emission around the periphery of the non-physical pairs. Is that significant at all? Um, let's see, I'm debating whether I should try to go back slides, but yeah, so in, in both the null tests and the, and the real ones, you do see this emission around the allergies and kind of coming off of it, which um, could just be because they are still clusters, even though they're not connected clusters. So that's why we try to do a model of um, and subtract that off. But you would still expect to see that because they are still, they are still clusters. So it could, could still be detecting diffuse uh, cluster emission with the stacking experiment as well. But that's not what we focused on. Okay. And so I think one, we've got time for one final question from Luca Cortese. Um, very cool results. How far are we able to link this technique um, to EG absorption line studies in the UV optical and FRB detections to start getting a complete picture of the properties of the LSS? Uh, that's a really good question. I might have to follow that one up on Slack. But um, so I know, yeah, there's the, the FRBs. You're able to get the line of sight um, magnetic field strengths as well when you with from the RMs with FRBs, which is very helpful. Um, but I haven't looked as much in detail myself in in terms of what they've been doing with like the optical and UV uh, line studies. Uh, but that's something that I've meant to follow up um, and see how we can kind of bring that together. Great. All right. Well, we should stop there. Thank you very much. There's I think there's a few more questions on. Slack. Uh, now we are going to hand over to poster presentations. Um, I think, Kristen, do you want to actually announce the, the poster winners? Yes. So we have three sets of winners that we're going to announce right now. Um, first, we'll go, we'll go for the poster winners for videos, then the poster winners for best students, and then the best student talks. Um, you'll have to wait for the carbon dioxide challenge till this afternoon. Um, that will be announced this afternoon. But yeah, so first we have the best poster videos. We had 34 videos submitted for the posters, um, and then you voted upon them for the top three poster videos. I would also like to thank Natasha here, um, who will be sharing the videos, but also put a lot of work into editing and creating the playlist of your submissions. So our first, or rather starting from the bottom, the third place winner, uh, was Miguel, uh, and hopefully we have a, yes, and we will now see his video.
Yeah, uh, great. Now, I'm sure. I just will check that we are sharing the sound. Um, that's the main thing. Okay. So I think it's working. <laughs> okay. I just also note that we'll probably have about time for about a minute of questions after each one if, if the speakers are online. So if you have got questions, okay. feel free to post them in Slack. Obviously, there won't be much time for questions, but we'll get through one or two if we have time. Okay, great. Um, also, I have put a link in Slack to all the videos for those people who might find this broadcast through Zoom, you know, inaudible or whatever. Um, just feel free to click on the links. Hello, my name is Miguel Gonzalez and I'm a PhD student from Macquarie University. Today, I'll talk about my group research on common envelopes. This work is focused on simulating these systems using a thermally pulsating HUD star as a tunnel for the envelope. Our main goal was to figure it out whether or not a common envelope can be triggered during a thermal pulse. These pulses are characterized by a sudden expansion and contraction of the star that lasts a few centuries due to periodical heating flashes. We also wanted to compare the pulse common envelope system with that of a similar donor, Alve, in the RGB phase. Finally, we want to analyze the influence of recombination energy and radiation pressure in the common envelope. For this, we create and evolve a two solar mass star using the stellar evolution grid code MESA until it reached the thermal pulse HUD phase. Then we map it into the SPH code phantom and put it in orbit with a 0.6 solar mass same particle. The simulation was run from Roch log overflow until it reached a self regulated phase. We run four simulations. The first one with an ideal gas equation of states at low resolution. The other three were run at high resolution with an ideal gas equation of state for one, ideal gas plus radiation pressure for the other, and a tabulation, tabulated equation of state for the fourth. This last one takes into consideration the recombination energy of the gas. The animation shows the simulation with high resolution and ideal gas equation of state. The inspiral phase occurs at 15 years and the self-regulated phase at 20 years. We found that the four simulations end at roughly 28 solar radii, giving away the same orbital energy to the gas. The simulation suggests that the common envelope may take place during the thermal pulse. But since the Roch low overflow phase time scale increases with resolution, its convergence may be at a time longer than the duration of the pulse. The still image in the left column shows the morphology of the common envelope from our system as opposed to one using an RGB star as donor, which indicates that its evolutionary phase affects the pulse common envelope shape. Only the tabulated equation of state unbound the whole envelope but in all cases, the binary survives. This confirms previous works in which the recombination energy is needed in order to unbound the system. Thank you for your attention. This is my ASA pressure talk. So we're on the cosmic atomic neutral hydrogen gas density evolution. Oh, sorry. From the <laughs> it's on a playlist. This so. is the sublimation rate density. It was a function of look back time. You can sorry. see it by a factor of 10 at the peak. Of the peak refuses to be paused. Sorry about that, Philip. I'm afraid you, you're not the <laughs> second winner. It's just on our playlist. Uh, let me uh, quit out of this. Okay, so I can't see any questions posted for the uh, for that speaker. Remember, if there are any questions you have, please do post them on Slack. And apologies if you can hear my dog barking in the background, one of the perils of working from home. Um, but I'll hand over to Christian to announce the, the second place. Yes, so our second place winner um, goes to Jake, Jake Clark. Um, and do we have the video? Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, so, um, friend, uh, friends online, I can try and mute us as well. If whether that will make things better or worse, I'm not sure. Sorry, go for it, Christian. Yeah, so on how stellar surveys can improve the properties of planetary systems. Um, and that. 
Let's start right. the video. Right, just complain immediately if you can't hear this. My name is Jay Clark. I'm a PhD candidate based at the University of Southern Queensland. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the land on which I'm coming from today, the Gaia Volunjara people, and like to pay respects to their elders, both past, present, and emerging. Now, I'm here today to talk about my poster here at the ASA, how do stellar surveys improve the properties of planetary systems? So if you've seen this before, awesome. We're going to learn more about uh, the science behind this poster. And if you haven't, awesome. Check it out after this video. So we have uncovered well over 4,000 planets orbiting stars in the night sky and well over 600, sorry, 6,600 planets waiting to be confirmed by ground-based observations around the world. And so we can look at these planetary systems and be able to see the transit depth and the radio velocity uh, measurements to be able to understand the size and mass of these uh, planets. But that is all based upon the stellar parameters, the effective temperature, the log G, the mass and radius of, of those stars is crucial to then better understanding the mass, radius, density, composition, and uh, the, we can go further on into characterizing these worlds. What type of atmosphere would they have? What type of geology would they have? Then better characterize what worlds are really Earth-like. So that's what I've been trying to do as a part of my PhD research. And this is an amazing plot showcasing the, the overlap between the Galar's latest release, Galar DR3, and the test sectors, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and where it's been observed. And there's this huge, beautiful overlap here. So then why not utilize uh, the information from both tests and the last. The question which I'm trying to answer as a part of my PhD project is what can we learn about current exoplanetary systems orbiting around the last stars? And so what I've been able to use as I've been able to utilize the last latest data release and use the effective temperature, log G, uh, the overall metallicity, and as well as bias parallax and magnitude values, who matches magnitudes to then use in an isochrome model to determine the mass, radius, luminosity, age, level zones of these uh, stars, which then affect uh, and then flow on into the planetary parameters. So what have, we been, what have we been able to learn? Well, I've been able to better characterize super Earths and in particular, these uh, short period super Earths down to a precision much better than uh, has been previously documented using not only these uh, new cell parameters but also the NASA's exoplanet archive and be able to use a weighted mean approach to better estimate the planetary properties being your radio velocity and your uh, transit depth measurement. So combining all of that together, for example, Corat 7b, I've been able to better characterize that log down to a precision of 3% for its radius and down to less than 8% for its mass. And so we are now at a better stage now to then characterize these worlds, what they're made out of, and continue further on with its habitability. Now, with Corat 7b with a surface temperature of 2,500 Kelvin, probably not the case. We're probably not never, never going to find life there. But what we've also been able to discover is that it seems like ultra hot planets, regardless of whether it's a hot Jupiter or a hot Neptune or a hot uh, terrestrial world tend to favor iron rich stars and also favor younger stars as well. And so here there's uh, older, uh, older stars and down here are younger stars. And so we're seeing that the form mecha uh, formation mechanisms for hot Jupiters and hot Neptunes and hot terrestrial worlds might be very similar and that this process might happen as there's more material around and less likely to happen where, the, where there's less material during um, younger population stars. And also what I've been able to do as part of my research is be able to determine, well, can we actually follow up these uh, plants from the ground and be able to work out a mass measurement? And it turns out it's going to be incredibly difficult for all these stars, and uh, sorry, for all these planets over here. But it's going to be pretty easy to then follow up for all these planets, planets over here. So over here going to be up here, almost impossible. Um, but probably doable for here. So that means that it's probably going to be it's going to be easier to confirm hot, uh, Jupiters and hot Jupiters around around glass stars than it is to try and determine your your smaller worlds here. So that's all I have. Here's my summary for my for my talk. And if you want to learn more, check out my poster. Thank you so much for your time.
Right, Brilliant. thanks for that. Uh, any ASA. questions? Like, again, I don't see any on Slack, but if, if there are any, please feel free to ask now. If not, okay, we'll move along to the, to the winner, I think. Okay. Um, the top um, video went to Mike Creel um, for mapping the diffuse low frequency sky. Um, so let's take away the last video. One major priority in radio astronomy is understanding the early universe formation history. Although the Cosmic Network Background, or CMB, which results for the Big Bang, is well measurable, the effect that follows due to the neutralization of ionized gas from the CMB due to its opaque nature is not. This period is also known as the Dark Ages. However, one can infer Dark Ages characteristics by looking at the differential temperature between the CMB and the Cosmic Dawn, the effect where the first stars started to form, sparking the epoch of reionization, which led to the full reionization of the universe. Understanding these epochs can lead to a wealth of information and give us more insight into the formation history of the celestial bodies we see around us today. One way to probe for these first stars, for example, is by probing the 21 centimeter hyperfine electron spin flip transition line from neutral hydrogen, where a change in electron spin state emits a radio wave of 21 centimeter wavelength. However, measuring the 21 centimeter line is not trivial, as it's formed by extragalactic and galactic foregrounds before receiving it with a radio telescope system. It is hard to disentangle these foregrounds, as they are around 3 to 5 orders of magnitude higher than the signal we desire. One way to combat this is through the generation of multiple sky maps, spanning a wide range of frequencies in angular scales. These maps can then be used to generate a foreground model to subtract from the 21 cm background signal. However, although smaller angular scale point source foregrounds are relatively well defined, low frequency diffuse foreground emissions, especially on the southern hemisphere, are not. This is mostly due to the complexity of solving the three-dimensional interferometric measurement equation, which is often simplified using a flat sky approximation, allowing one to Fourier transform between the visibilities the system sees and the intensities on the sky. However, this results in loss of wide field accuracy, as well as the ability to measure the full sphere, since one can no longer distinguish points exactly opposite on different hemispheres. As a result, we are forced to use more complex methods to image the full sky such as mosaicing, which is often a time-consuming and strenuous process. Instead of assuming a flat sky, one could also use spherical harmonics to solve for the measurement equation instead. Much similar to how the Fourier series operates on the boundaries of a circle, spherical harmonic basis functions operate on the surface of a sphere. These basis functions can be split up in three distinct types, zonal, tessral, and sectoral harmonics, which depend on the spherical harmonic order L and rank M. Charlotte noted that when looking at Earth's periodic rotation over a sidereal day, one could notice sectoral harmonics operating in the same rotational plane. These harmonics are only rank M dependent and do not mix on the sky. We can utilize these characteristics through employing wide field, center pointed radio interferometers performing transit interferometry, measuring the sky passing overhead. This way, we can measure the full sky within a day's time frame, whilst maintaining exact wide field effects. Fourier transforming the visibilities with respect to M allows us to describe the visibilities as M odds on an M by M basis. If we then also expand the system characteristics or beam transfer function and sky into spherical harmonic coefficients, we can reduce the measurement equation to a simple linear equation. Solving for the sky in this case would simply be inverting the equation. Using this method with the engineering development at RAID 2, a wide field radio telescope in Western Australia, we present a 159 megahertz M mode generated sky map. This map is created with two 24-hour observations to remove the sun from our sky image. The map has a 3-degree angular resolution and is super-sampled in a 1-degree pixel grid. The northern hemisphere is fit using a rescaled version of the updated desourced HESA map, where MSI is the doll. This map is the first in a series of EDA2-generated diffuse southern sky maps, with goal to help better constrain a diffuse foreground model and will be made publicly available once published. Hello, my name is Miguel Gonzalez. Great, thank you for that. Um, so there is a, a question um, on that talk from Adam Ballon. Um, you generate sky maps which you subtract from the observations. How can you be certain that you aren't subtracting the signal you are trying to observe? 
And just a context, simple theorist here that doesn't understand. I don't know whether our speaker is present to give an answer. Oh, Mike, are you here? Yeah, come to the front, please. <laughs> Sorry, Mike's actually physically present, which uh, is great. Um, so he's just making his way down to the lectern. He'll be here in a second. Hey. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. So currently with the sky map is just modeling the like full sky as we see it. So it's just a diffuse sky that like the system measures. So what you eventually want to do is you want to take like a model of like a background, for example, through to like statistics or like other ways that it would normally be constrained. And then you would use like, for example, methods like the Karun and Lueffe transform or um, other decomposition methods to subtract this background for your foreground from your full sky map to generate a foreground model. And theory, theoretically, you would do this across like a wide range of frequencies of different diffuse sky maps. So you would have like a better constraint for your um, diffuse foregrounds in this case. Does it make sense? Yes, I think so. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, that's all the questions we have time for. So maybe we will move on. Um, I think there's a final couple of announcements from Christian before we wrap up this session. Uh, yes, yeah. so I guess first, please join me in, I guess, congratulating again the three video winners, uh, Mike, Jake, and McGraw. Um, and now we're going to move to the student prizes for the best poster and the best talks. Um, first, we'll do the best student posters. Um, let me share a screen here. Uh, Um, hopefully people see that. So our third place poster is from Marcus. Um, how do young pulsars spin down? Um, so I guess join me in congratulating Marcus on the award. It also comes with a hundred dollar gift certificate um, for which you should talk to Kim about which gift certificate you want um, for this prize. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, the second place award. Oops, too far. Um, am I on? Yes. Second place um, from Sonia Pankov on placing progenitor constraints on supernova remnant population of the large Magellanic Cloud. Um, I suspect that Sonia is at home being in Melbourne and therefore not going to be at any of the hubs to receive this uh, in person, but uh, congratulations, Sonia. Thank you. Uh, uh, and that comes with $200 um, that you should talk to Kim about gift certificates as well um, for that. And our, the top, Student poster was voted for Anna Murdy on tri hybrid line list, a CN example. Um, yet another remote uh, student, but congratulations, Anna Murdy. Thank you. Uh, and this comes with $500, uh, which you should talk to Kim about um, offline. Okay. So, yeah. Join me in congratulating all three of the student poster winners um, for this. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it to Emma um, to present the top three student talks. Um, take it away, Emma. Okay, thanks very much, Christian. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes. 
hopefully that didn't reveal too quickly who the student uh, prizes have been awarded to. So as always, the SOC has had a really tough time awarding these student prizes because all of the student talks were outstanding and the standard is just incredible. So um, uh, well done. So uh, in reverse order, we have uh, the third prize, which has been split uh, between two recipients. Sarah Webb from Swinburne, who spoke on fast flares in the galaxy and the unsupervised machine learning used to find them. Uh, and that prize is shared with Georgie Taylor from ANU, who spoke on developing supernova models for cosmology applications. So uh, congratulations. So I'll get all of our award winners to turn their cameras on and say hello uh, at the end of um, uh, announcing all of these prizes. So if you could get ready for that. Um, and we have in second prize, Caro Durkin from Macquarie, who spoke on density slopes of early type galaxies from spatially resolved Muse stellar dynamics up to a redshift of a half. So congratulations, Caro. And uh, drum roll, please. Uh, the first prize for the student talk for 2021 goes to Stephanie Monty from ANU, who spoke on astronom astrometry with Mavis, pushing past the limits of Gaia to the crowded centers of globular clusters. Congratulations, Stephanie. So if all of those student prize talk winners would like to turn on their cameras just briefly, if, or come to the front if you happen to be uh, at the ANU hub, so Macquarie and Swinburne will be at home. If you are present. And uh, we will just give you another round of applause. And I will stop sharing my screen and I will uh, forward those names of those recipients to Kim, uh, who will organise your vouchers for the prizes. Congratulations again. Okay, so I think that's the end of this session, I believe. Christian, there's nothing else for you to announce at this point? Um. No, are we having them say hi at the front of the session now that they're at the front? Yes, they are. There, I see people at the front of ANU. Yep, there they are. Do they want to say hi? Just wanted to say thanks so much. We're both very grateful. Very excited. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah, so that is the end of the session um there is one more prize for the co2 winners that will be announced later today um this is the i believe the last student challenge um but for now go have your coffee or lunch break and we'll see you back in 45 minutes uh christian there's a message in the chat um from darren saying that there's an anita town hall meeting coming up next Yes, and there isn't a need to attend Harvey. He is correct. <laughs>